Hello. Welcome to Application of Fiber Optic Technologies in Wireless Communication Systems with Dalma Novak. I'm Mike Hamilton, <clears throat> your host for this IEEE Microwave Theory and Techniques Society webcast, which is sponsored by National Instruments. Before we start, I'll mention a few housekeeping items. First, this presentation will be archived. A recording should be posted approximately 24 hours after we finish this presentation. We will send all registrants an email when the archived webinar goes up so you can revisit it or share it with your colleagues. Second, we encourage questions. We'll answer them after the talk, but you can submit them at any time during the discussion. In your question in the Q&A box on the left side of the webcast window, and don't forget to click Submit. Third, some words about the interface. You can enlarge slides by clicking on the top right of the slide area. You can also go into full screen mode if you desire. Refresh or reload the current page if you encounter problems. If you're listening over your computer speakers, you can adjust the media player volume. Remember, you may also need to adjust your system's master volume. The icons at the bottom of the webinar window include a resource list Clicking that link will start the process to download copies of the slides that will be presented today. Apologies for the cutoff slides as they are now. Please refer to the PDF copy if needed. Now let's introduce our speaker. Dalma Novak is VP of Engineering at Farad LLC, where they are developing advanced antenna, RF communications, and RF over fiber technologies. Prior to co-founding Farad in 2004, Dr. Novak spent 12 years as a member of the academic staff in the Department of Electrical and Electronic Engineering at the University of Melbourne in Australia, the last six months of which she was professor and chair of telecommunications. From June 2001 to December of 2003, she was a technical section lead at Dorsal Networks Incorporated and later at Corvus Corporation, where she led cross-disciplinary R&D teams developing WDM hardware for long-haul transmission systems. Her research interests include microwave photonics, fiber radio systems, wireless communications, high-speed optical communication systems, and antenna technologies. She has published more than 280 papers in these technical areas, including seven book chapters. In 2007, she was elected to the grade of IEEE Fellow for contributions to enabling technologies for the implementation of fiber radio systems. Dr. Novak was president of the IEEE Photonics Society, or IPS, during 2014 to 2015, and she is the former chair of both the MTTS and IPS technical committees on microwave photonics. So now it's my pleasure to turn the virtual podium over to Dr. Dalma Novak for application of fiber technologies, fiber optic technologies in wireless communication systems. Dalma? Thank you very much, Mike, and uh, it's my great pleasure to be able to uh, talk to everybody today about fiber optic technologies in wireless communication systems, and I would also uh, like to thank very much MTTS for giving me uh, this opportunity uh, to talk about this topic. Here is a short summary of what I'd like to cover today. Uh, for those of you who may not familiar, be familiar with the field, I would just like to get a, a little bit of an overview into uh, why fiber optic technologies are used in wireless communication systems. And also it's very beneficial to see how the technology has evolved uh, over the, the last couple of decades. So I'd like to cover some of the very early concepts and the demonstrations and then really progress to how the technology is being used in current wireless communication systems. And then finish off talking about some of the exciting emerging technologies uh, which will have a profound impact on how the fiber optic distribution network is going to evolve over time. When the optical fiber was first developed uh, many decades ago now uh, as a transmission medium, all of its benefits uh, that were being considered for uh, transporting digital uh, communication data uh, also started to be really very relevant to transmitting analog RF signals. And in fact, that's really how the first concept of using fiber optics in a wireless communication system came about. Fiber optics has great uh, benefits such as very, very low loss 
and also low weight. And those uh, particular benefits uh, were the reason why uh, they started to become uh, considered for transporting wireless uh, signals over optical fiber. Another key benefit of fiber, which is often overlooked, is that that very low uh, attenuation is also independent of the frequency of the RF uh, signal as it propagates through fiber uh, compared to coax, for example. And that's really a great benefit and is really uh, creating some interesting technology advantages for transporting very, very high frequency wireless signals over optical fiber. So those particular advantages of fiber as a transmission medium really led to considering how fiber might replace coax and copper in conventional telecommunication systems where the wireless signal will be distributed from a central office or a central location to antenna sites that might be remotely located. And the objective of really doing this was to provide an opportunity to extend the capacity and the range of existing wireless communication systems, essentially really expanding the RF footprint. And in doing so, they really allowed uh, the wireless network site to be simplified in its design. It was a way to be able to accommodate uh, new geographical locations where you had a number of users that uh, required wireless communication capability. And it was a very simple way, an efficient way to in fact get that signal to those remotely located users. If you look at how uh, this technology has evolved over time, in fact, the first reports of using optical fiber to transport wireless signals came about almost three decades ago now. And it started off with uh, British telecom labs looking at how they might replace copper in what was then at that time an emerging type of communication system, which was cordless telephony. And at that time, it was copper that was being used to transport the, uh, the this was a cordless standard CT2, to transport those channels uh, from the head end uh, to the distribution point uh, in order to be able to get the range closer to the user. So this was the first concept of replacing that copper with optical fiber because of the, its uh, very, very low attenuation benefit. And the way in which this was done was to transport those RF frequencies over optical fiber as what's called a subcarrier multiplex signal, essentially taking all of those uh, telephony channels, multiplexing them together in the frequency domain, modulating an optical carrier or a wavelength, and then transporting it over uh, a piece of optical fiber to the receiver. And the way in which this was done was using the available technology at that time, which was to directly modulate a semiconductor laser. And the, the frequency of these channels uh, was around 800 megahertz. What this enabled uh, the, uh, the engineers at BT Labs to do is to really simplify the hardware uh, that was existing at the distribution point. So when you had conventional copper, for example, uh, the base station really had a lot of uh, hardware in there that also was required to carry out the, the switching of the, of the channels themselves to the users. By replacing it with optical fiber, you could really take that uh, quite complex equipment and put it back at the local exchange. And really what you needed to have then, um, very simplistically, was just an RF optical interface. So that was really a mechanism to be able to optically receive the telephony channels and convert them from the optical to the RF domain, and then in the upstream direction, be able to convert the RF signal uh, from the RF domain to the optical domain. So really very much simplify the equipment uh, at the antenna itself. And it's really this type of motivation to try and uh, put all of the complexity back at the central office or the local exchange, that driver in order to simplify the equipment at the antenna itself has really uh, dictated how the technology and also how the network architecture has evolved over time. So it wasn't just work being carried out uh, in the UK, but there was also work being done in the US. And uh, this was work 
uh, considering not just the cordless telephony, but how could you transport cellular signals over optical fiber? And again, this was done uh, more than 25 years ago. So really cellular technology was at its, at its infancy uh, in those days. But this was really um, a way to, again, replace the coaxial cable with optical fiber and be able to remote antennas uh, to a number of different users using optical fiber. And this was work done at GT Labs, and GTE were known for developing very high-performance lasers for the CATV industry, and that is the type of uh, laser that they were using to modulate and with the, um, the wireless frequencies. There was also work done uh, in Japan, again, looking at microcellular applications and replacing coax with, with optical fiber. And this uh, architecture here, again, just shows you this concept of really simplifying the equipment located near the antenna. So in its most simple sense, this is an analog fiber optic link because you modulate the laser and at the other end you receive and recover those RF signals and then you amplify it before it's transmitted by the antenna. And in the reverse direction going upstream, the signals that are received from the user will be amplified using a low noise amplifier. They will be modulated onto an optical carrier and back to the base station. So again, you see the, the driver to simplify the equipment. And there were uh, field trials done in, uh, uh, several decades ago as well. This was a field trial that was done at AT&T Bell Labs. And again, they really wanted to demonstrate this concept of being able to uh, install a wireless communication system, be able to accommodate a number of users, and they showed that they were able to go over uh, tens of kilometers of optical fiber with a reasonable uh, radio transmission ranges. Even in those days, uh, people were very forward thinking and they weren't just looking at current wireless technologies, but also looking at next generation wireless communication systems that would work at very, very high frequencies, in particular millimeter wave communication frequencies. And this is work done at NTT several decades ago, and this was really the first demonstration of a millimeter, wi millimeter wave a communication system that use an optical fiber remoting link. And uh, for these very high frequencies, you need a different type of encoding technology. So this was the first demonstration of using a high frequency lithium niobate external modulator. So again, this was an analog fiber optic link, but this was using external modulation of the laser rather than direct modulation. And in Germany, uh, in a similar time frame 20 years ago, again looking at very high frequencies, and this was also very forward thinking now, looking at even higher millimeter wave frequencies up to 60 gigahertz, where they did a field trial uh, being able to transport broadband signals. You had voice and also video being transmitted at uh, very high millimeter wave uh, frequencies. And as you go higher up in frequency, the challenge then is how do you modulate such a high frequency RF carrier onto an optical signal? And there's been a lot of work done over the years on different uh, clever techniques on trying to do that. And the way that they did this in this example, again, was using a external modulator, but uh, biasing the modulator at its minimum transmission points so that you could generate twice the carrier frequency. So there have been many demonstrations, and really uh, what I wanted to point out here was how the technology has evolved. And the key thing is that the technology has very much evolved from uh, transporting those wireless signals over optical fiber in the analog domain to now what is really most prevalent is transporting the wireless signal as a digital uh, communication signal, and that is some of the architectures that I'm going to cover right now. And fiber optics in wireless communication systems is very prevalent in a number of different applications in, uh, in building systems, distributed antenna systems, also extending cellular coverage as well. Uh, it's also used extensively in outdoor cellular communication networks, both for backhaul and also front hall systems. 
And now uh, it's not so much as why is fiber optics used in wireless in a wireless communication system, but really it's well recognized that converging these two types of networks actually makes real sense. And what you have is the capacity that optical fiber gives you with the mobility of a wireless communication system, which is what everybody wants. And so, in fact, the two really uh, merge together very well and provide a cost-effective, high-capacity solution for providing users with access to very, very broadband services. And so, in fact, there's almost a natural convergence and integration of these two types of very different networks. So that's a little bit about uh, how the technology has evolved. And what I wanted to cover now is some of the drivers for how the fiber optic technology and the architecture is in fact evolving. And it's really being directed very much by how the wireless communication system itself is, is changing. And this here I'm just showing uh, the communication spectrum for all the different types of wireless systems that exist at the moment and will appear in the future. And they cover anything from the um, UHF all the way up to very, very high millimeter wave frequencies and almost getting into the terahertz frequency range now. So it's the diversity of wireless networks that is really creating some uh, interesting challenges for the implementation of the optical fiber infrastructure itself. And the diversity, both in terms of the mobility of that network and also the data rate that it supports. And here I've tried to show how, uh, as we go to in the future, we really have uh, the, the need to basically converge both fixed and also mobile wireless communication systems. And if you look at how the different systems have evolved, you can see on the x-axis here I'm showing the, the data rate and uh, initially you could only achieve very very high data rates uh, in the excess of hundreds of megabits per second with uh, what we call fixed wireless access systems so really point to point a fixed antenna but now that is really changing as we move now to uh, all the investigations of uh, fifth generation wireless technologies. Fifth generation is really offering an opportunity to get one hundreds of megabits and even gigabits per second to the user, but at the same time really providing maximum mobility as well. And that is providing challenges not just in the wireless domain but also in the implementation of the, the fiber optic backbone that supports that type of network. If you look at how the standards have evolved uh, over the years, very early on, uh, the services that, was, that we had was really just voice. So this was all pre-smartphone. Pre and the standards uh, evolved over time from uh, analog data to digital wireless standards like GSM and CDMA. And if you look at that, this, the the data rate that um, was provided to users has started to increase as well. So at one point in time, we were um, quite satisfied with kilobits per second, but now moving very much to smartphones and all of the different applications that they offer. And with those applications, that is really driving and introducing new services that demand uh, data applications in 100 megabits per second and also gigabits per second to the user. So now we are really looking at the standardization of fifth generation wireless communication systems and that will provide uh, some very interesting uh, technology developments and also opportunities uh, in the future. Uh, here I've also shown those data rates and how they've increased over, over time. And again, you can see that over the last 20 years, we've really gone from uh, kilobits per second to the user now to gigabits per second uh, with fifth generation. And also with wireless personal area networks. And I'll talk a little bit about that uh, later in the, the webinar when I talk about very high frequency wireless systems. 
So another driver for how wireless communication systems are evolving is our demand for data. So our demand for data is not abating at all, and in fact it's getting uh, much more dramatic in terms of uh, what we need. And, and this is all very much driven by um, smartphone applications and smart devices. And so uh, we were quite satisfied with just uh, audio and video, but now really with uh, other types of applications like gaming, the, the data rate, and in fact, if you look at, this is a, a slide by Cisco when they talk about the data traffic forecast. And this is typically updated uh, every year because in fact uh, the the demand for data is increasing at such a dramatic rate. But uh, the mobile data traffic is going to be by, within the next year, uh, the amount of data that we will consume and demand per month is going to be up in the over 10 exabytes per month. So um, that is really quite astounding uh, how much data, and this is often called the, the data storm, and that is really driving how all of our networks are evolving. So uh, in addition to our uh, demand for data and, and capacity, the other thing that is really driving how wireless networks are evolving is uh, the coverage demand. And, uh, and that is really because where we use uh, our devices is changing very much. So we started off um, in the early days with just cellular systems being at the macro cell level, but now uh, things are changing dramatically. There is uh, a real driver to create small cells where you have an environment where you have a very large number of users within a small area. Uh, and not just small cells, but also a type of cell where you have different types of service applications. So this is often called a HETnet, a heterogeneous network, where you may have cellular being combined with Wi-Fi, for example. So we are going very much to much, much denser networks and where spectral efficiency and being able to increase spectral efficiency is key. And so uh, all of these different types of network technologies and standards that now exist really need to coexist, and they need to coexist in a way uh, that allows uh, different vendors to supply that equipment and to operate together. And uh, as we all know that uh, when we move from uh, one of these uh, cells to another, we also demand that the way in which those services are delivered to us is done in a very seamless and transparent way. So these are drivers uh, that are really dictating how the, the network is going to evolve. And 5G really is uh, a very exciting development for those of us who work in the wireless communication space. Uh, there are very different, uh, very exciting technologies that are being considered, and there, it encompasses so many different aspects. And this is a vision uh, that Huawei often present, and their vision of, of 5G and how you may be able to accommodate very high data rates, 10 gigabits per second to the user, uh, the Internet of Things where you have a very large number of users as well and sensors interconnected with one another, but also you have uh, Terra cells where the, the data that is being generated is so high uh, that you ha need to have very, very um, high multi, multi, tens of gigabits per second uh, wireless links being able to support the data transmission from one cell to another. So fiber optic technology can really play a key role in supporting these types of networks. And uh, the one area where it is very well established now as a technology is to provide a mechanism for providing the backhaul for mobile communication systems. And this is one example showing how it uh, is able to do that. So all of the data that is generated and being received at the cell tower can be able to be transported back into the switch network through a fiber optic uh, cable. However, there are challenges uh, in order to do this. And uh, in addition to being able to support the bandwidth and the coverage, another challenge is that the base station at the cell tower requires quite stringent clock and time synchronization. And that depends very much on the actual wireless 
uh, application itself. But the challenge for that is that the fiber optic link needs to be able to support that type of latency. In addition to being able to be used uh, as a back hall, optical fiber also plays a role in the front hall. And this is showing the, the difference from a, uh, moving from a back hall to a front hall. So in a conventional uh, macrocell system, the uh, baseband processing unit uh, that is connected to the rest of the network through optical fiber sits at the bottom of a cell tower. This cell can then be divided into a number of smaller cells where you have now also antennas supporting each of these smaller cells. And the interconnection between this baseband unit and those uh, smaller cell towers is also implemented with optical fiber. And it's this link that's called the front hall. And uh, that is a key application space for uh, fiber optic technologies. So this is an example showing the type of topology for a mobile front hall. With, which is using fiber optic link. And the key aspect to this is that the, the RF and the digital portion of the base station is actually separated and the data is transported between those two parts of the, the network using optical fiber. So the remote radio head, uh, which does all of the RF processing, is located very close to the antenna while the base station, which carries out all of the digital processing of the, the data at the digital level, uh, is located at the bottom of the base station. And this interconnection um, is implemented with optical fiber. And there are several standards that are used to implement that uh, data transmission over optical fiber for front hall. And two well-known uh, standards are CPRI, Common Public Radio Interface, and OBSI, which is the Open Base Station Architecture Initiative. But the key uh, point here is that that link between the remote radio head and the, the baseband unit is a digitized link, a uh, point-to-point -point cable. And in fact, this is a, a well-established uh, technology area for fiber optic links in, in this type of application. This slide shows you a little bit more detail in what equipment is needed here. So the remote radio head, you have the antenna system, and then you have the various uh, gain associated with up and downstream. But the key part here is that the, the radio signal needs to be converted from the RF to down to the intermediate frequency. And it's actually at the intermediate frequency level where the digitization takes place. And that's necessary to do that because of the uh, capabilities of current A to D and D to A technology. One of the key challenges for future uh, 5G networks uh, and networks where uh, multiple antennas are going to be implemented is the impact on having multiple antennas uh, on the actual data that is going to be generated on that front hall digitized fiber optic link. And this slide shows an example of that. So the more antennas you have, the more channels, and the higher the bandwidth, the higher the sampling rate, which in turn leads to a very, very high bit rate over the optical fiber. And in fact, now in CPRI uh, uh, digitized links, uh, the technology that is used is typically 10, up to 10 gigabits per second. But uh, it's expected that in the future, this fiber optic network may have to support up to tens of gigabits per second, even approaching 100 gigabits per second, which is going to present some interesting challenges. So I'd like to now uh, talk about a little bit about some of the emerging technologies. So the, in the front hall network, there is now also a move to extend the length of that uh, fiber optic front hall. So move the baseband unit away from the base of the cell tower and in fact uh, centralize them at the, uh, at the central office. And this is also called a virtual pool of baseband units. It's also called a cloud radio access network. And there are advantages to doing this, both on uh, operating and capital expenditures, but also very much in terms of performance and being able to share all of those 
complex baseband processing resources amongst um, a large number of cell sites. It also allows for more intelligent management of the interference between the, the different cells. And uh, this is very much a, a key aspect of future networks in this CRAN type of technology, uh, which also, again, now puts some stringent requirements onto the implementation of the fiber optic link itself. And as I mentioned before, latency constraints are really a key challenge here. So uh, the maximum round trip propagation time between the remote radio head and the baseband unit depends very much on the actual standard. But some examples for, are for LTE, it's about 700 microseconds, and for LTEA, about 400 microseconds. And that really sets the limit for the length of the fiber optic cable itself. So this is going to be interesting in the future, how um, the fiber network may be potentially redesigned to, in fact, be able to accommodate longer fiber uh, transport lengths in the future. Uh, there are a number of demonstrations that have been carried out recently on cloud remote uh, access networks. And uh, this is one example uh, that was done last year at Mobile World Congress where they were really looking at implementing the CRAN for the next generation 5G wireless networks and have been able to demonstrate uh, improved performance but also being able to reduce the, the power consumption of the network as well. And it will be interesting to see how these types of uh, applications evolve and also how the fiber optic infrastructure changes to accommodate that type of uh, implementation. Another emerging uh, technology is what's called an active antenna system architecture. And uh, this is really making the cell site a lot more advanced than it is right now. In the conventional uh, concept of a front hall, you have the fiber uh, connecting the baseband unit to the remote radio head. But then you still have some coax, which is used in interconnecting the passive antennas to the remote radio head. There is now a move to actually incorporating the RF processing technology in with the antennas themselves. So in this case, your optical fiber will go directly to the active antenna. And there are advantages uh, in, order, in doing this. And one is really to make the antenna more intelligent by being able to support how the capacity is changing within the cell itself. And this is an example uh, showing how this can be done. So by putting the RF processing and the beamforming equipment uh, located right next to the antenna, the beamforming capability can in fact be made more intelligent. And so you have more independent control of being able to support the beam and where the beam is directed according to where the users are so it can change in real time. And these are some examples showing how the radiation pattern can change and to support different types of uh, radio standards as well as different frequencies and also uh, down and uplink uh, beamforming as well. And that also has a very big advantage in that the power losses in the coaxial cable itself can be reduced by having the RF processing directly located with the antennas themselves. And uh, there is a lot of research going on in uh, being able to support this type of uh, technology and everything from coming up with new antenna designs to beamforming uh, algorithms to also making the amplifiers themselves more efficient and being able to directly integrate the RF hardware with the antennas. And uh, there are a number of uh, field trials that have been demonstrated recently, both in the US and also overseas. And again, uh, using optical fiber as the as medium for connecting an active antenna system to the actual baseband unit. Another emerging technology uh, that is also being demonstrated for 5G applications is massive MIMO. And this also will have some profound implication on how the fiber optic links themselves are going to be able to support this. 
So a MIMO, multiple input, multiple output, really means that we're now looking at very, very large number of elements uh, in the antenna itself, potentially hundreds or thousands of antennas, in addition to number of users as well, where the uh, EM spectrum can be spatially reused. So really the, the advantage here is to dramatically increase the data throughput and also the system capacity. But this is to have some impact on the fiber optic network here because the more antennas there are and the more users, uh, it means that the, the data rate that this uh, digital fiber optic link needs to support is going to get very, very large. And uh, in fact, the, as I said before, the data rate will be exceeding 50, potentially 100 gigabit per second within the next few years. So there'll be some interesting challenges uh, for how the fiber is actually going to be um, installed and also some architecture trade-offs in how this best might be able to accommodate these types of emerging technologies. What this also uh, implies is that perhaps one of the ways in which we can uh, get around having to have very, very high uh, data rate fiber optic links and very high data rate optical transceivers to support that, that data is perhaps going back to uh, analog fiber optic link. If you compare the type of equipment that you have at the remote radio head with the two different types of links, what I'm showing here is the conventional uh, technology for a mobile front hall which uses a digitized IF over fiber link. This works on having very standardized interface, and this is a well-known technology now, but the hardware is quite complex, and in fact, it uses a lot of energy. There is a way in which we could simplify that a little bit by uh, not converting down or translating in frequency to an intermediate frequency, but in fact, uh, staying at the actual wireless carrier frequency. This simplifies the radio head but the challenge really now is that the uh, A to D and the D to A technology has to be um, very high performance. You need uh, very high um, uh, sampling rates and, that's, and that need to work at very high frequencies and that's going to be a challenge. Going to back to an analog uh, fiber optic link and you can see if you look at this architecture here, it's really revisiting the way in which these types of systems were implemented uh, several decades ago. This really is the simplest way in which you can transport a radio frequency over optical fiber. It's transparent to what is the, the equipment that you need at the remote radio head. The challenge though is that the, the link distance is going to be limited because this puts some um, challenges on the noise figure and the dynamic range that can be supported. And also another challenge is that this is not compatible with time division multiplexed uh, systems. So uh, the analog RF over fiber has some advantages. Uh, however, the key challenge will be whether it has a real opportunity to in fact be integrated in conventional uh, TDM based systems. Another uh, emerging uh, application is uh, evolving is uh, small cells. So again, this goes back to uh, being driven by capacity demands. So very much where you have small areas, where you have a large number of users, and that really places a, a big increase in the capacity. And one of the frequencies that are being considered to be able to support small cells is the 60 gigahertz uh, radio band. And this is unlicensed and globally available around the world. You have around 8 gigahertz of bandwidth uh, within that 60 gigahertz frequency region. And that really allows you uh, to provide uh, applications where you can support multi gigabits per second uh, to the user. In uh, a 60 gigahertz wireless communication system, there is also a benefit to having a fiber optic uh, distribution network being integrated with that. It provides a very efficient low loss way to transport the radio signals to the remote radio head and be able to efficiently support interconnecting 
multiple 60 gigahertz cells together in an indoor application, for example. This is an example showing uh, some real uh, experiments that have been done with a 60 gigahertz wireless link that was fed uh, using optical fiber. And again, as I mentioned before, the challenge is how do you get this gigabits per second of data at 60 gigahertz onto an optical carrier? And there are several ways to do that. And the technique that uh, we used in this particular experiment was to use a dual wavelength uh, optical signal that was modulated by a multi gigahertz uh, gigabits per second data at 60 gigahertz. Uh, through a free space optical link. And with, this was demonstrated both indoors and also outdoors. What's interesting to see is how all of these different types of technologies uh, are really starting to uh, come together and be considered for next generation 5G networks. This is a, a high level view from SK Telecom which shows a number of these different technologies that I've talked about. For, ex for example, uh, massive MIMO, uh, looking at uh, ultra-dense small cells, a uh, very high number of users, Internet of Things, also looking at cloud, radio access network types of architectures. Or a potential next generation 5G network and a network standard. And again, really combining ultra high speed, ultra high speed to the user and also massive connectivity. So a very large number of users as well. And it will be very interesting to see how these technologies evolve over the next few years, uh, particularly now as a number of different uh, working groups are looking at the potential standardization for 5G systems. This is a slide just showing some of the network development and the field trials that are taking place around the world. And it's interesting to see the different approaches that some of the different groups um, and the telecommunication operators are considering. So some of the groups are working in the lower frequency uh, domain in the 3 to 6 gigahertz and looking at different types of technologies for making the beam forming um, more intelligent. Uh, at the higher frequency range, there are also groups that are looking at a um, large number of antennas, but again, a different type of uh, beam forming application working at very, very high frequencies. So Anything from 3 up to uh, in excess of 30 gigahertz is really being considered now for 5G and to support all of the requirements for next generation 5G networks. So where does this really uh, lead fiber optic technologies and uh, what, how is that technology going to evolve? The 5G requirements really, the fact that they're offering these order of magnitude increases in bandwidth and spectral efficiency, number of users, cell density, and latency will have some profound ramifications on the fiber optic link itself. And uh, for those of us who uh, do a lot of R&D in, in this space, it's a very exciting area. There's a lot of um, work that needs to be done on improving optical components and also on the physical layer itself and on the network design and the management. And uh, many groups around the world are now considering uh, developing photonic integrated circuits uh, to support 5G networks. So low power, uh, low power dissipation is key here. So this is really trying to provide all of the functionality uh, on, a, on the same uh, photonic wafer, for example. And obviously cost is is very important here when you're talking about large number of users. How uh, the, the, the data is going to be transported over a digital CPRI link uh, is going to be very interesting too. And uh, the, there will be a need to try to reduce how much the bandwidth is required to expand in these types of digitized front hall links. 
So the front hall implementation is going to evolve as well, and there may be an opportunity to go to uh, different types of uh, implementations such as analog fiber optic links. I think it will also be the case that WDM technology is going to continue to play an important role here where you have different wavelengths being able to be able to increase your spectral efficiency in order to support a large density and a large number of radio networks altogether. So a number of different exciting opportunities for the fiber optic technology development in wireless systems. So just to summarize, uh, I wanted to, uh, hopefully I've talked about the capacity demands and the diversity of standards and how that's driving how the optical fiber network itself is being developed uh, and being able to be successfully integrated with future wireless communication systems. All of the emerging technologies that are being investigated for future 5G networks, uh, like massive MIMO and cloud, cloud RAN, active antenna systems and 60 gigahertz small cells, will really uh, have profound impact on the implementation of the fiber optic front hall and also on other types of distribution networks as well. So it will be very interesting to, to see how this evolves and, um, and uh, I'm looking forward to, to seeing all the, the way that the 5G networks are going to be standardized eventually. So with that, I would like to um, finish my talk and now we have some time for questions. So I will hand over to Mike. Great. Thanks Thanks a lot, Dalma. That was uh, very, very interesting and enlightening. Uh, so uh, now it's time for our question and answer session. And before we start, uh, please remember that you can still submit questions through the Q&A panel. Uh, right now we've got a, a short list of questions, but we'll uh, we'll tackle those, and if you have more questions, please feel free to uh, to submit those. Uh, okay, so first uh, audience question here. Could you expl explain a little more uh, the term digital IF? Sure. Let me go back to... Uh, I'd So uh, digital IF is really referring to the fact that the way that the front hall network, uh, the fiber optic front hall network uh, needs to be implemented is to actually down convert the wireless carrier frequency to a lower intermediate frequency before it's digitized. And the reason it's done that is because that really is the only way in which the uh, digitization technology can support uh, the, the data rate that, that results. So that is really what digital IF means. It means that the carrier frequency uh, is down converted, first of all, to a lower intermediate frequency, and then it's digitized uh, and becomes a uh, digitized link or a serial link. OK, great. Uh, on slide. Uh, 31 or 32, where you were talking about adaptive antennas. I was wondering if you could elaborate a little more on on how this is done. Is is this is this a, a packaging and integration aspect, or is it an actual technology development aspect? So uh, I think it is it is basically both. Uh, the packaging is definitely part of that by having to put the uh, the beam forming switching technology directly with the antennas themselves. But it's also a technology development uh, effort in that the antennas themselves are being redesigned. And they're being redesigned so that they can in fact support uh, multiple RF frequency bands and the, the switching technology behind them is then being uh, directly integrated with that and being able to support the switching of all of the, the, the different antenna elements as well. So the technology development, I'm going over to uh, slide um, 33 here.
the the technology development is uh, coming through with respect to the design of the antennas themselves, uh, the integration with the RF processing and the, and the beam forming, but also with the design of the amplifiers in there as well. Okay, so the fiber aspect just gets the data to to that system. It's that's cor that's so. correct. So okay. so that is that that is also the fact that uh, the the antenna technology and the processing technology is changing. Uh, is also changing the the data requirements that result on the fiber optic front hall link itself as well. And uh, one thing I didn't mention on this slide, this ORI interface is also another standard for a fiber optic front hall standard in addition to the CPRI and the OBSI. This is a standard uh, that was developed in order to allow different vendors of equipment. So uh, you have one manufacturer making the remote radio head, for example, and another manufacturer that makes the, the baseband unit. This type of interface allows both of those uh, pieces of equipment to operate, interoperate together. So this is a, another type of standard that's been developed for the, for the front hall. Uh, but ultimately, anything that's going to change the uh, the number of antennas the, and the data rate of the wireless communication system is going to impact the resulting uh, digital data rate on that the the fiber optic front hall link itself needs to be able to support. Okay. <clears throat> okay, and I think this question uh, may may feather right into that. So, how fast can lasers be modulated and what is the maximum millimeter wave frequency that could be uh, loaded up onto a, onto a fiber? To fiber. So first of all, with respect to uh, the, the semiconductor lasers, uh, the really if you look at uh, commercial off-the-shelf components, and I'm not talking about uh, research devices here, but uh, a commercial off-the-shelf laser can be directly modulated uh, up to tens, uh, up, sorry, up to um, of the order of four gigahertz. Potentially, some devices can be modulated up to about ten gigahertz, depending on on um, the way that they're packaged. Uh, in order to be able to uh, modulate an optical carrier at a higher frequency than that, you need a a, a device that allows you to. Uh, go up to and support that type of frequency. And really, the only type of uh, commercial component that's available to do that is a, an external modulator. So you have uh, lithium niobate technology is, is well established in order to do that. Uh, and that device can work up to 40 gigahertz, up to even up to 60 gigahertz. So uh, as long as you have a device that allows you to provide the electrical to optical conversion. There is really no limit to the magnitude of the RF frequency that can be modulated onto an optical carrier. And when that process um, is carried out, it's basically an intensity modulation process. So if you look at the optical spectrum, you see a, an optical wavelength and then you see two sidebands. It's a double sideband. Uh, with carrier spectrum. The, the challenge is in order to, how do you get that device to work at very high frequencies, but also transporting that, that type of signal over optical fiber actually creates problems with respect to fiber dispersion because fiber dispersion uh, essentially changes the way, uh, the phase of each of those uh, signals with respect to one another. So when they get to the to the optical receiver and, and they get converted back into the RF domain, you can actually get a cancellation of some of your power because of fiber dispersion. So that that's one of, one of the challenges. Okay. Let's see, we have another uh, question here. Can you describe what type of optical fiber is used for front hall? Is it standard single mode fiber or other type that's being used? It's standard single single mode fiber that is used for that. Uh, multi mode optical fiber is also used in uh, for ap 
applications that involve wireless systems that is typically used for shorter uh, link lengths uh, in an indoor application. So there are some uh, indoor distributed antenna systems that work on transmitting a wireless signal, for example, at say 900 megahertz or 1.8 gigahertz over multi-mode fiber, but in that case, it's only over a very, a very short distance. Okay. Um, and I think this may be the, the last question, and I'll, I, I may elaborate on it just a little bit. Are there any joint optical slash wireless networking issues that are or will need to be addressed? I, I take that as um, what are the tall poles in the tent, and when, when and how will this be adopted? Uh, so the, uh, I, wanted, I guess I just wanted to clarify that the networking with respect to the actual uh, implementation of the um, the control yeah, of the, I, the wireless signal I'm, versus the optical. I'm reading this as what are what are the tall poles that need to be addressed so that we can get to the, these uh, uh, these five G networks. So the latency will be a, a challenge on the on the fiber optic link design uh, in terms of uh, all of the the, the 5G uh, number of users and um, not, not just the data rate, but it's really the the um, uh, the, the implement and the implication on at the at the base station level with respect to the the number of users and. Um, and the impact of that on the, the latency and what is required on the fiber optic side uh, will re uh, create challenges for implementing the fiber optic network itself and how, how far and how long that, that link can actually go. And, and the, what, can you remind us what the dominant source of that latency is? Uh, it's really just a, a delay issue. So the the fact that it takes a certain amount of time for the signal to be transported over optical fiber um, to and from the the antenna itself uh, it is really the 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 thing that needs to be overcome. So you you can't really get around that. You can't make it any faster in a sense. So um, that is going to ultimately limit the the link to transport distance itself, uh, and that may require some different types of architecture implementations. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, I'm afraid we are out of time. Uh, we do still have a few questions here in the queue, and the presenter will follow up with those unanswered questions uh, offline. Uh, let's see here. Do you want to go? As we said earlier, this session will be archived on the website at mtt.org. Uh, we recommend that you visit that and peruse the site. All registrants will get an email reminder with the website address when the, uh, the archive is available. For attendees that would like to receive PDH credits, please follow the link in the webcast view and also use the code that's provided on the last slide of this presentation, the slide that's being shown right now. And once again, I'd like to thank Dr. Novak for an excellent presentation. Our thanks also go out to National Instruments who sponsored this webinar. And of course, a special thanks to our audience for joining us today. We do hope that you found today's event valuable and that you'll return for future IEEE Microwave Theory and Technique Society webcasts. Thank you very much and have a good day.